Welcome, bet riders around the world. My name is Gary Solomon, and you're watching the Laid Back Bike Report. It's so nice to have you guys all with us today for the Laid Back Bike Report. Boy, we got a jam-packed show for you. Uh, we have more people on this show than I thought there were bent riders all together uh, in the world. So uh, we're going to get to it a little at a time here. We got lots of exciting things to talk about. Let me tell you what's coming up in today's webcast. We have an important announcement from the Hostel Shop. We have an American racer heading to France for the World Championships. We have a discussion of electric assist for recumbents. We're going to talk about the Shanghai Bike Show. How about the new linear airliner? We're going to have a chat about that. The Arkansas and National Senior Games, uh, plus a Bichetta incentive offer. And we're going to have a final goodbye to Ian Sims. So, folks, uh, first of all, let me show you who the guys are that are helping me out in the webcast today, our Laid Back Bike Report crew. Uh, one at a time, let's introduce them to you. First of all, uh, from uh, Dallas, it's Doug Davis, the owner of Bicycle Evolution. Hello, Doug. Hey, Gary. Good to be here. It's good to have you with us. Doug's going to be a big part of the show today. Uh, also, from uh, Alfred Station, New York. Our buddy, Peter Stoll, the Bicycle Man. Hi, Peter. Hi, good to be back. Good to have you with us as well. And let's go off to Salzgitter, Germany, where we'll find our show director. It's Lars Kamm. Hello, Lars. Hi, folks. Okay. And we also have in Colorado Springs, Colorado, Larry Seidman, who's kind of filling in for Denny today on the sports. Hello, Larry. Hello. Good day to be inside. <laughs> Is it, you don't often say that in Colorado, I know. And finally, down in Jackson, Mississippi, it's our good buddy, Trey Burgoyne. Hello, Trey. Hey, folks. Good to be here. Trey's handling our media as usual, so uh, we're in good hands, I'm sure. All right. Guys, if you could, please remember to uh, click on that little logo uh, down there and uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, you'll get notifications for uh, any of our shows or videos that uh, that we post. And uh, also in uh, the upper right-hand corner, you'll see the little uh, I. That stands for information, and it will take you to our website. We'll talk more about what's at the website, the website but uh, uh, suffice it to say, you'll find anything you need to about the laid-back bike report there. So take advantage of that if you would. And of course, we would love you to participate in the live chat. We got a bunch of people on there already today. Uh, the live chat makes this all so interactive and fun. So uh, please uh, jump on there. If you uh, are on YouTube uh, uh, on the computer, you're going to see it. Uh, let's see, right over there on the side. And uh, if you're on mobile, you'll see it down below. You just scroll up a little bit and then uh, just type in your comment or question. We'll bring them up to our guests. Uh, and you can just chat with uh with some of the folks, uh, Larry Varney, uh, we're so crowded in here, we can't get him on until a little bit later, but he's on live chat. Larry, thanks for joining us. We'll see you in a little bit. Uh, yeah, chat away, guys. Let me see real quickly. Besides Larry, we have Rambling Randy 65, uh, Derek Pirey from uh, South Africa, uh, Peter Vick, uh, hello. We'll take a look at what you guys are writing in a little bit. Julie Lovegrove from England. Hello, Julie, good to see you on there. Uh, Joe McCormick up in Michigan. Hey, good to see you, Joe. Uh, Joe Antonio, hello. Uh, Tim Strike Trips, also from England. Tim's uh, Tim, I talked to him the other day. He's going to be a future guest. Uh, let's see. SBC Clydesdale, hello. And uh, yeah, that's about it for right now. So let's uh, let's move on. Uh, and if you guys can participate, we would love to see you on the chat. Today's show is sponsored by. TerraCycle. 
makers of exquisite recumbent parts and accessories for your bent. And Trailside.bike, a fine recumbent bike shop on the Withlacoochee Trail in Florida. And Cruise Bike, designed for the cyclist who wants to ride farther, climb faster, and adventure more. All cruise bikes and frame sets ship free in the USA. And Lightning Cycles, the aerospace designed and race across America record owning recumbent you have always wanted. All right, guys, I think it's time to jump right into the meat of the program. And I can't think of a better place to start than a very good friend of the show from way back. We've had uh, him on uh, as an interview guest a couple of years ago. And there's some big news. So uh, this has to do with the hostel shop in Stevens Point, Wisconsin. So let me see if we can bring on uh, Rolf Garthus and... Uh, Let's talk to Rolf for just a minute here. First of all, Rolf, thank you for coming on today. Hi, Gary. Thanks for having me. All right. It's great. Now, you've got some news. Uh, it was an announcement made on Facebook uh, a week or so ago. And I'd like you, if you could, to tell us what is going on with the hostel shop right now, please. So it's, it's uh, come to our attention over the last several years that it was time for us to retire. Uh, some of the hints were we had a lot of people asking us when we were going to retire. <laughs> so that's a pretty good idea that even if we didn't think it was time, maybe a lot of other people did. Anyway, uh, we decided it was time to go. We were running out of energy and uh, couldn't really contribute the way we wanted to running the business. Uh, fortunately, we have a really good staff. And in the last couple of years, as my energy started to uh, wane, they picked up the slack and took over very well. But our our goal in selling the business was to sell it to somebody who could continue to run it successfully and also to somebody who would continue to employ all our existing employees. So we felt um, very fortunate to find Brianna, uh, the new owner of the hostel shop. All right, well, that sounds like a good point to uh, bring uh, Brianna on if we could. To maintain the continuity, seems like that's really important to you. So there is Brianna Vanda. Hey, Brianna, hi. Uh, I think you are muted. Can you uh, unmute yourself? Do you see how to do that there? Can you hear me now? Yeah, that's fine. Right. Yes. Thanks. All right. You can say hi now. People hi, everyone. How are you today? Very good. So, Brianna, so, yeah, so Ralph wanted to maintain the continuity, and so there was a transaction. Can you tell us a little bit about how you, what you knew about the hostel shop before and how this uh, transaction came about? Okay. Um, so, I am actually originally from central Wisconsin. Um, my dad owns a bike shop in Marshfield, which is about uh, half an hour away from the hostel shop, and um, he's been selling upright bikes. And uh, Rolf um, doesn't just sell um, recumbent bikes. He also sells upright bikes. And um, the, my dad and Rolf has, um, have developed quite a partnership and friendship over the years. So I've known Rolf um, casually for a really long time. And I've known about the hostel shop for a really long time just through kind of inventory interactions that we've swapped back and forth um, and conversations we've had about the upright bike business. So um, when... About nine months ago, I stopped in to kind of chat with Rolf about some of the upright bike trends and see what was going on there. Um, he gave me a tour of their building. Um, I, they've been here for quite a while, but I've never gotten the behind the scenes uh, tour. And um, while we were chatting off what I thought was off the cuff, he mentioned, well, why don't you just buy the hostel shop? And I laughed thinking he was joking and um didn't really think too much more of it at the time, but um, kind of a couple weeks later, um, received a, another phone call from a broker um, that indicated that Rolf was pretty serious. Um, and so the conversation started from there and it just seemed like a really good fit. Um, the business is really well established in Stephen Point and in the recumbent industry. Um, like he mentioned, his staff is awesome. They can they have built a really good um, business here with the lines that they carry and the staff that they have that it seemed kind of like a no-brainer to jump into it. 
Very good. Well, that's exciting. So now um, let's let's jump ahead a little bit. Now you you haven't been you haven't been involved with the hospital shop very long at all. So it's not <laughs> fair to ask you too many questions. I guess maybe in very general terms, Brianna, could you um, could you tell us what your your plans are, especially um, with regard to the recumbent lines that you have? What are your plans for the future with the hospital shop? Um, right now, you're right. I don't, I will be honest, uh, the recumbent industry is relatively new to me. I know a little bit about it. I've written some, um, but I'm still just kind of learning all the lines and the different features there. Um, I think the topic of this, uh, this broadcast today is going to be spot on. I think that the uh, e-assist bikes um, and trikes um, are becoming more and more popular and are going to um, be a bigger focus for us. There were definitely noticing a trend in selling more and more of those um, from what I've seen in the records here in the last probably year and a half, two years, but I see that trend really increasing. Okay, that sounds great. Well, folks, um, to finish this segment up, I want to let you know that uh, Brianna and I have been talking a little bit and we uh, intend to uh, stop out at the hostel shop uh, this summer and uh, take a little bit more in-depth look with one of our uh, LBR at your LBS uh, videos. Yes. And so by then, I think you might be up to speed, Brianna, and you'll be able to take us around. Maybe, uh, Ralph, yeah. hopefully you'll be around to to meet up with us as well. We'd love to, to see both of you and uh, and share some time at the, at the new hostel shop. Would that be all right? That'd be great. All right. Definitely hope to see you, Gary. That sounds great. Well, Rolf, thank you so much for coming on and for everything that you've done for the recumbent community for all these years. Uh, I'm sure I'm speaking for everyone uh, when I say thank you so much for being a pillar of the recumbent community. And uh, Brianna, we all wish you the very best. Uh, I know you get a lot of support from our viewers in the recumbent community. So we'll yeah. see you guys soon. Thanks for coming on. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. All right, guys. So... Let's see here. Let's get that off. Yeah, we're going to get to that in a minute, I guess. Okay, folks, let's um, move on to our next segment, which uh, has to do with a, um, a friend of mine that I've known for a few years, a very interesting fella. Um, he is a, uh, a, a, a racer, uh, an ultra racer, among other things, and has been uh, racing with uh, cruise bike uh, for quite some time. And uh, he has decided to uh, take his racing act overseas. Now, many of you will know that uh, last year, uh, Lars and I uh, took the laid back bike report to England and covered the world uh, championships, the world HPV championships in Kent, England last year, uh, which was just a, an amazing event for us. Uh, we had a great time there. Uh, that event moves around from country to country in Europe, and this year it is in France. Uh, there were no American participants uh, last year in the event, and we heard a lot of questions from the Europeans about that. So I'm very excited to, uh, to bring Larry Oslin on right now. Larry, there you go. Larry, uh, are, you're in North Carolina, am I right? That's correct, near Asheville. Right. In the, okay, in Asheville, right? And uh, Larry's going to tell you a little bit about what his plans are for this summer, which has a lot to do with uh, racing in Europe. Larry, uh, hi. Tell us a little, a little bit about what your ideas are. Well, I uh, just recently heard about the uh, the World Championships over in Nandex, France. Um, very soon after I had finished uh, doing a seven-day cycle uh, across the Blue Ridge Parkway with uh, some other cruise bike friends. And uh, it kind of piqued my interest, and I asked a couple questions and found out it was uh, in about the middle of July. And uh, I kind of just, uh, on a spur of the moment, said, well, I, th I think, I'm, think I want to go to this. And uh, I'm part of a, a group called the International Recumbent Training Group. And uh, a bunch of them in that group said, hey, we should just put together a, a GoFundMe for you to try to try to help you with your expenses to go there. And so that's kind of how it was born. And uh, so I'm really excited trying to make plans, buy tickets and uh, try to figure out the courses and, and uh, you know, how I'm going to train with the, the six weeks that are remaining. And an intensive uh, uh, French language course as well. <laughs> yeah. 
<laughs> I should have just said bonjour, Monsieur. Yeah, bonjour. I, I think I so know. You, like we'll start working on it right now. So. Right. <laughs> That's very exciting, though. You're going to have a great time. I'm excited for you. So, um, yeah, guys, um, let me uh, let me just say that we will have the link to uh, to Larry's GoFundMe uh, campaign to get him to Europe uh in the description below of course like we always do um so if you um if you uh, are a supporter of uh, of american racing in europe which you should be uh let's get larry over there and help help him out there now just if we could larry take a minute and uh, tell us uh, exactly what you're going to be racing you have uh, you have a bike behind you there is that it right yeah i'll see if i can get up and move out of the way um a pretty good shot of this yeah this is a cruise bike, uh, the Vendetta, also known as the V20. This is actually the one that was built up for me when uh, I did the four-man team for Race Across America two years ago. So this is pretty much the exact bike. Um, it has a front disc brake on it and uh, a rear rim brake and uh, full, full drops. Um, a lot of my time trialing, I will ride uh, a handlebar that's just a tiny little stubby thing with my hands in here. But when a, when you have a ride with a lot of climbing involved, it's better to kind of have full control. And as you know, with cruise bikes, you can kind of use your upper body um, to help you climb some of the hills. So that's the machine I'm going to be taking. And, uh, and so I'm pretty much training primarily on it right now. And there will, you told me that you saw on the information from the website, there are a few hills actually on the courses. There are a number of different uh, there are a number of different types of heats there, but uh, yeah, there we go. Thank you, Trey. There's uh, this is from their website, and you can see the one says hill race. I assume there might be some hills there. Yeah, there's actually it's a pretty good bit of climbing. Am amazingly, it's definitely not a flat course. I think the first uh, right out, it's a 12, 12 kilometer loop, and I think right off the bat, you pretty much climb for three kilometers. <laughs> Um, and I think the maximum grade is 10%. So there's not really no real big, big deal there, but uh, it's definitely not, not just a flat, uh, uh, criterion course where you can just go all out all the time. Um, they even have a video on the website that I think they show you about three, three quarters of the, uh, of the route, uh, driving in a car. So that's kind of helping me too. But I think there's four events there this year. I think there's a 200 meter flying start event. There's a one kilometer um, standing start uh, race, and then there's a five kilometer hill climb race. And then it's all finished off by a three hour race around the, the road course. All right, well, and I think you told me when we were uh, when we were chatting uh, this week that you had you had intended to, at least to uh, to uh, uh, enter all of those if you can as many as you can anyways yeah oh yeah I mean I'm I'm definitely not the sprinter kind of guy but uh, you know I'll I'll enter any event that I think that I can finish <laughs> so it'll just be fun we we actually have a we have an HPVA association here in the united states they have most of their events kind of up in the midwest chicago detroit and they have pretty much the same kind of lay layout they've never had a three-hour road course but usually we'd be on a velodrome but we might do like a one-hour time trial all together so i'm kind of used to doing you know the shorter events i i'll still usually place kind of in usually the upper end of them so i think uh i think i'll still have a good chance with uh you know, placing high against uh, some of our European competitors. I think I looked at the website. I think there's a, I think there's over a hundred people registered now, which is kind of exciting. And for most of you that know about the the HPVA, I mean, it's it's not only just recumbents like you know the the Vendetta, the cruise bikes, the Bachettas, but there's also a lot of trikes go there. There's also um, a lot of bellmobiles or streamliners, which is a, a two wheel. Um, totally enclosed uh, um, recumbent as well. So right. there's, and, there's and also like uh, occasionally you'll see a pedal car or two that we saw last yeah. year too, a four wheeler pedal car. They're, they're amazing. They, 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 those are really big in England. So, so one question I had for you, Gary, when you were watching the thing last year, did they have anybody like on a, a normal bicycle? Yes, they did. Uh, there were a couple of not very many. There were a couple of uh, of regular bicycles that were there, and there was uh, Lars can can I think uh, back me up on this. I think there were two upright trikes. Lars, do you remember? Am I right about that? Weren't those upright trikes? 
Yeah, uh, there were uh, three actually, I think, upright strikes with, uh, well, what you would call a delta trike, which has one one wheel in the in the front and two in the back. But but not recumbent. They were upright. They no, were no, they were upright. upright. Yeah. Right, right. Kind of interesting. So yeah, you'll see all kinds of different things. And a couple of uh, uh, I brought a couple of uh, uh, purpose built vehicles. They were. I guess they were Velomobiles technically, but uh, they built some. So you never know what you're going to see there. Uh, it's it's always interesting. You'll have a blast, I'm sure, Larry. So we're excited for you, and uh, we can hope uh, we can hope for the best, and hopefully bring home some uh, some more of those uh, little medals that I see in the background there. You can add a few European ones maybe yeah, to the to the great. collection. Okay. All right, Larry. Thank you so much for coming on. We wish you the best. We'll be watching, and uh, maybe we'll talk to you again afterwards, and you can give us your. Uh, your uh, views of, of how it was and and what you saw when you were well, there. That sounds great. Yeah, I, I actually I have a camera mounted on the front of my bike, so I'll, I'll actually video everything I do there. So maybe I can feed you some of that footage. That would be great. We'd love to see that coverage, and we'll point to it if you pu publish it yourself. So right. Larry Oslin, thank you so much for coming on the Laidback Bike Report. Thank you very much. Take care, Gary. Okay. You too. Bye-bye, Larry. Great. All right. So good for Larry. Let's see, folks. Let's – Move along to the main event uh, today. Uh, I've uh, been promoting it uh, most of the week. Uh, it's a subject that's uh, eh, somewhat controversial. I'm not sure exactly why, but uh, it is uh, electric assist for your recumbent bike. So uh, just to kind of introduce the subject, uh, I think uh, it kind of caught a lot of people by surprise a number of years ago when more and more uh, trikes and bikes were out there with electric assist. And a lot of people thought it wasn't going to really amount to anything. But uh, no matter your view, it has amounted to something. There are a ton of them out there now. Uh, I made the, um, the guess that it might be close to 50% of the uh, bikes, or, or especially trikes, that are being manufactured now. That might be a little high, but I did, uh, over the last couple of days, uh, ask uh, a number of manufacturers about what their estimates were. And uh, I put those on Facebook on our laid back uh, bike report uh, page. You can take a look. But we had everything from uh, we had everything from Haza saying that their um, their specialty bikes were up to eighty um, uh, percent motorized. Uh, to um, HP Velotechnic, uh, where they said that probably very close to 50% uh, is what they are doing. And they thought it was higher in Europe than it is in the U.S. Uh, we talked to uh, Trident Trikes, and they said it was about 25%. Uh, so we got a number of different views uh, on it there. So whatever the numbers, they're large. And so Consequently, we want to discuss that here and make it a part of today's program. So uh, a couple of guys specifically on the early part of this discussion, I uh, can't think of anybody better to uh, to talk about these things. Number one, uh, Doug Davis. Uh, you guys uh, know Doug is either Mr. Wizard or the owner of uh, Bicycle Evolution in Dallas. And uh, also, let me introduce uh, our buddy uh, Peter Stull, the bicycle man as well. Now, these guys both have a big background in, um, in, in e-assist. Doug specifically though, is an electrical engineer. He doesn't just play. Oh, don't say that out too loud. <laughs> so uh, it's now, it's now widely known, Doug. Yeah. So uh, Doug's going to kind of take the lead on this and Peter, uh, please, uh, I want you to jump in uh, with whatever comments you may have or whatever you want to add to the conversation and let's get it started from there. So I think the first question, Doug, we'll get you off with this one is, what is e-assist? Uh, so we're doing the camping show today, right? Uh, no, no, no. This is electric. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So uh, electric assist is, uh, you know, there's there's a lot of variations. We'll go into that. But to specifically with bikes, it's really talking about using some kind of electric motor to assist your pedaling. Um, meaning that uh, it, you, when you push, the bike pushes a little more to help you with what you need to do. Uh, to go forward, to climb hills, what have you. And there's a bunch of variations in electrical assist that assist out there. Um, the, the, the main kind uh, that you see a lot uh, will have some kind of variability that lets you say, I want this much assist. Or, uh, and the other kind has a throttle, which basically you push the button and it pushes the bike for you to help you out of, over a hill or something like that. So those are the two kind of controls that you'll see out there. Um, when we, when you look at how they're put on the bike, 
um, this is where there's some interesting stuff. There, the, 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 the hub motor, which is kind of the early version of electrical assist you see, is a motor that fits on the back or the front, depending on the configuration wheel. And it drives that wheel for you. Uh, it usually has a torque sensor or a cadence sensor. Doug, let's go, if, let's, since you're talking specifically about them, how about we go through those right now? Yeah, we can flip through Starting flip with, the slides, uh, yeah. Yeah, let's get the slides going with that mid drive. Let's, there's three yeah, we basic start with, kinds, okay. right? So, um, well, so we, 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 yeah, so let's. <clears throat> Well, this back the up one there, Trey. The, yeah, yeah, right so we, there. Okay. All right, so we kind of did a little thing. And the the mid drive is an interesting thing. When you go to a normal bicycle shop and you say, "I want a I want a a, 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 a hub motor or, or a e assist," they'll say, "You know, what a mid drive." And in a normal bicycle, the mid drive is the middle of the bike. It's the bottom bracket. It's where the cranks are. But in the recumbent world, uh, the mid drive may actually be in the middle of the bike, which is what we're showing there. Uh, it, which is not where the cranks are. The cranks are way up front. And so there's a little bit of industry confusion on that term mid-drive. Uh, so we wanted to show a picture of what a, a true mid-drive looked like, which is this one here where you see the motors actually sitting behind the seat. Okay. Uh, as opposed and, and, to a bottom opposed to, drive. Let's go to right, that one. Extra, extra, extra. So we, you will hear this one in a bicycle shop talked about as a mid drive because a normal bicycle shop thinks of the bottom bracket being the middle of the bike. We tend to use the term crank drive or bottom bracket drive in the recumbents industry. So when you're talking to people, you're getting online or you're, or, or you're looking on Amazon or, or wherever you're looking for this, you see that term mid drive, be careful of which kind you're looking at, because the recumbent kind, there could be both. Uh, if you look at the bike industry, when they say mid-drive, they're really talking about this thing that sits out in front of the brooms, it helps your cranks, uh, which we're showing there. Uh, and uh, the the industry of recumbents today, like this ice trike there, they sell them factory built with these crank drives uh, out there. But if you look on the Shimano site, this is a Shimano uh, drive, it'll actually call it a mid-drive. So <laughs> if there wasn't enough confusion in a recumbent industry anyway, th we've, we've added some more with the, with the lexicons. Going to the next slide here, and we'll go to what we were talking about, a hub drive, which is where the, the, the motor itself is built into the wheel. Uh, this one you see in, uh, uh, you know, in, in, in different categories. Retrofits are pretty common with this one. Uh, you also have some industries that have sprung up around building this particular wheel, uh, the Copenhagen wheel is probably the most famous version of it, which is a, a retrofit for a regular bike. We swap out the wheel and off you go. Uh, we tend to uh, uh, use, at least in my my shop, we tend to put the Falco, which is what this is a picture of in there, uh, as conversions for trikes. Uh, my, my daughter has one that I built for her years ago when, when Falco was just starting up. Uh, and uh, it's been fantastic. She's got that, you know, tens of thousands of miles on it. Uh, and we can go into that later. But there, there are benefits and uh, of all of them, and like everything, it's a trade. Uh, the mid drives have the benefits of having the motor drive your cranks, uh, which actually lets you use your gears in the in context with the motor. Uh, so the the motor cadence, uh, the, the motor RPM translates into cadence RPM. That is helpful in some situations, and we can talk about that in a minute. Uh, and then the, the hub motors, like you're seeing there, they tend to drive at one speed, uh, which is an additive effect to, to your pedaling on the on the uh, chain rings in the back. So that's okay. the that's a quick level of talking through that. Um, let's go on to the next one where the, we got the how. Yeah, so we're going to talk about how, how do e-assist of various kinds, how do they work? How does it work in general? Well, uh, how it works, um, and, and again, we talked a hair and touch about it, is there's an electric motor, in this particular one, this is a hub motor, but they all kind of work the same. There's an electric motor on the shaft, whether the shaft where your cranks are or whether the shaft is where your uh, back is, that is applying additional force beyond your pedal stroke uh, to the motor. And basically what that, uh, to the to the drive system, and basically what that does is, is put more energy into the drive, more energy, energy into the drive makes you go forward. Uh, and so this picture right here shows you the Falco system. Again, this is one that, that we sell. Uh, it's got disc brakes. It's got the integrated torque sensor, which is really helpful. It means there's like one extra part you got to hang off the bike or one less extra part. It's got an axle, so a solid axle in it. And, you know, the, 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 the nice thing about these are they're fairly, they're fairly simple devices and they're fairly easy to retrofit onto a bike. And they're also fairly easy to swap out if you want to take the electronics off because you can leave the controllers mounted, just unplug this and swap out the rear wheel and off you go. So that's, uh, you know, the, the crank drive is a very similar 
thing. We don't have a good picture of one of those. I couldn't find the one that I wanted. Uh, but basically, you're doing the same thing. You're adding energy into uh, the, the, the cranks uh, where the bottom bracket would be. Okay. And then the last, of course, is the, the one you saw, the, the picture of the Outrider track earlier, which is really a motor that sits out there uh, and, uh, and, and pushes along at another spindle or another chain ring uh, in parallel to the existing one. This is a Bafang. Uh, yeah, let's not ride? get to the thing yeah. just yet. Yeah. Let's uh, you you I think wanted to talk about uh, in terms of how they work, the different ways uh, the pedelec system. I think you might have mentioned <clears throat> throttles and levels of assist yeah. and the levels of drag. Now, what are, tell us about those? Sure. So uh, there's a couple of three different versions of this as you just rolled through. The pedelec is the uh, you know this electric assist, which basically when you push the pedal. There's a little torque arm that engages that engages. Oh, okay, this guy's wanting me to go forward, and then the, the bike will provide some assistance. Most of those have a programmed level of assistance, so you can add, add how much uh, help you want the bike to give you under certain conditions. And a lot of them, and certainly the more modern ones, can actually look at things things that are you know that are happening. So, okay, he's going up a hill. Uh, I need to give him more assist, even though my level is three. Uh, I'm going to give him some work to try to flatten out the hill a little bit. So I put more energy into it to kind of keep the same torque levels uh, on, on the, on the, on the uh, drivetrain. Uh, and then you can of course dial up the assist and it's going to add more to it. But again, it takes more energy from you. So you've got all of the above going on uh, while this motor is going on. And then we've, I saw some, uh, some very new models that look at your heart rate and they have, uh, some programming that says th I want to make sure my heart rate is never exceeds 150, as an example, and uh, we 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 can set that. And when the heart rate starts to go up into the 140s, the the amount of assist translates into a higher level of assist, and uh, that goes up even it goes up and helps the bike propel and let the heart rate go back down. What about levels of drag? You were talking to me about that, and I wasn't really sure. I don't think that's commonly yeah. understood. What is that? Yeah, mean? so that's so that's another interesting thing. Um, everything on the drive frame adds drag, and when you're adding a a a, 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 a hub motor, uh, for example, or a crank motor, you're adding drag to the drive train that you have to over, overcome. Part of the overcome is with the electronics, but the part of the overcome is in the drivetrain itself. So one of the things that's really interesting about like the modern day hub motors, like is when you coast. So you want to have, uh, we've got a huge thunderstorm that's come in here all of a sudden. So the <laughs> lights are flickering uh, and, and, and the guys are running outside to get the bikes out of the hub. Okay. Uh, Peter, be so, ready to take over at a moment's notice. Yeah. yeah. Them, so. Well, you're seeing bikes moving behind me because it's like, Oh my, you know, we, we it's a, it's a frog <laughs> strangler over there. Uh, but uh the uh, the the amount of uh, of of of, of, of load on the drivetrain right. uh, increases because of these, and again, part of it gets compensated for by the motor. But later on, when we talk about uh, the uh, the the effects of e drives when you run out of juice, uh, you have to worry about that because you're pulling a motor now and a battery. So you want a system that when you disengage, it puts as little load on the drivetrain as possible. And again, the modern day hub motors do this, the modern day crank motors do this, but they still add something and you kind of have to to talk to the guys who are building the bike or providing that and say, really, how much parasitic drag does this thing add to me if the longevity of that is 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 something that you're worried okay. about? Yeah, that's something you need to keep in mind, yeah. obviously, when you're yeah. buying. So, all right, let's talk about the models now. Um now that we've talked more uh, generally, let's talk more specifically. So, sure. Um, first of all, we're I think we're going to talk more about uh, retrofit and do it yourself before we get into the models right, right. that you well, can buy. So, so and so, we can uh, Trey go ahead with that Bafang uh, slide. We're going to go through some slides on this too. Go ahead, Doug. Okay. So, there, first of all, um, it's very possible to do do it yourself on one of these things. They are not complicated. Um, there are some things you need to know, both engineering, mechanically, and electric, and electrically, and there's some safety precautions you probably need to do. Um, I've seen the ones come in that people have bought on Amazon before. Uh, they come in with 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 some interesting pictures on how to put them on your bike and uh, a box full of parts, and they assume that you kind of know what you're doing. And I had one come in not too long ago that uh, the customer couldn't get it to work, and uh, uh, he he shows up with it, and um, I'm looking at it, and so there's no fuse in here anywhere. And uh, in the lines, I said, did you get any extra parts with this thing? He said, oh, yeah, here's a whole box. He went back to the car and came back and handed me the box. And there's like fuses and switches and other stuff that he didn't put in. So, well, you probably need these because what happened here was it shorted out and it burned up this, burned up your battery pack. And if you had the fuse in there, that probably wouldn't have been an issue. 
but uh, anyway, he, uh, he, he we 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 worked with it. Uh, Buffang, which is the picture you've got on there, is probably the most famous do-it-yourself kit. That's how they started. You can get them everywhere. Um, the bike shops can install them for you. Uh, you can you can order some series of these right off Amazon. Um, they're fairly simple devices. They are bottom bracket driven crank drive uh, uh, assistance motor. Uh, you do need to know how to take the bike bottom bracket off. You need the tools for that. Uh, but once you do that, you screw this thing in, screw the cranks back on it, and off you go. Uh, it's not very complicated. They have gotten a lot better with their, some of the early ones were, um, a little bit in the, uh, interesting in the Chinese way of in, interesting times, but the newer ones work really good. Uh, right, let's go on trade. Let's go on to the next one. Let's the next go one through the, some of these we can go through the more speaking quickly. of China, speaking of Chinese, here's a magic pie. That's another hub. That's a hub motor. Uh, and another one that has some serious, uh, long, uh, longevity in this industry. They've been around for a number of years. Uh, you also hear this one called a golden motor or golden pie or a number of other pies that for some reason or another pie has become uh, synonymous with these things. And so you constantly hear people talking about, I got a pie on my bike. And for a while, I didn't really understand what they meant. Oh, yeah, they got a golden pie or a golden motor in there. Uh, and they're getting again, This is another do it yourself. You can get these kits uh, on a number of places. Uh, and uh, you do need, again, electronics knowledge and some bike shop bike fitting knowledge but other than that they're, they're not terribly hard to put on go ahead, uh, go ahead uh, the one. Yep. Uh, there's a the copenhagen wheel we talked about that one earlier that's one of the more famous ones uh that is supposed to be a drop-in replacement it's almost a drop-in replacement uh there are a few odds and ends that are there particularly with around the axle and using a, a solid axle with with a uh, threaded mounts as opposed to a screw through axle but other than that it's pretty quick, easy to drop in and use them uh, the batteries, everything's all built into it. You can put external batteries on some models, but this this particular one, you've got the batteries and everything built in. You charge it up through the little cable there, and off you go. Uh, right. They have a pretty short endurance, but they are for somebody who needs a you know twenty mile commute with some assist. It is a good, a very good option. Okay, go uh, ahead. The next buddy, one. It looks there's our buddy. Yeah, looks, uh, there's our buddies on a uh, on a uh, uh, for Falco. That's a Falco kit, and again, we put plenty of those in there. And like I said, that's the one my daughter rides, and uh, uh, I've had very good luck with the latest generations of them. Peter and I have both swapped war stories about some of the earlier generations, but uh, I think everything is working pretty well nowadays with them. So uh, this is a Volvo. Uh, this is not uh, the guys from uh, Harry Potter. This is, uh, the, the, this is, well, I think it's voila, isn't it? Voila. Voila. voila ma. Yeah, no, I know. I was making fun of it. Uh, <laughs> another good, and again, another hub motor retrofit kit. This one does is a little bit more complicated than the Copenhagen. There are extra parts that you need to worry about. It does have a external sensor, sensor setup you have to put on and some external wiring. And, uh, I, I know from repairing these things that it doesn't like broken wires. So, uh, again, be very careful if you do this yourself uh, and make sure you protect all your wires. Uh, when we do these, we usually get uh, some mesh wire protection uh, conduit and we run all the wires through them because some of these, this one in particular, doesn't like broken wires. Uh, I don't blame it. I don't like broken wires either. But uh, the, the, the fact of the matter is uh, the do-it-yourself kits don't necessarily come with those parts and you need to keep keep in mind when you Very do that good. all right yeah next one there's a pretty uh another another retrofit kit uh i somewhere. have I've only seen these on a bike. I haven't worked on one yet, so uh, but I understand they they work very similar to the other ones. This one does have a push button kind of throttle on it uh that comes standard with it where you can push the button and off it goes uh so it's a kind of a neat system uh go ahead with the next one. Uh, it's a Clean Republic, uh, also a retrofit kit, a little bit more clean, a little lower powered. Uh, the batteries and the uh, come in a bag uh, in that, and then uh, we can talk about the defunct ones next. Yeah, how about uh, maybe we can uh, I, maybe go to Peter on this. Uh, Peter, not in any way that uh, you are the kind of yeah. guy that needs to talk about defunct uh, things, but I'm <laughs> not. You're say not it, Peter. You're, I think you're not a defunct <laughs> expert, but I thought maybe. Uh, you have a couple of slides that we have yours actually that might be pertain this. Can you tell us? So uh, you probably can't see the uh, script, but we're going to talk about first uh, Go Swiss. Okay. Uh, Go Swiss was a Swiss. Hey, how's that for for? I, I read the title. <laughs> it's a Swiss built unit. It came on the HP Velotechnics until last year, and uh, then the parent company decided not to produce them anymore. So they're not available. They say that they're going to be providing warranty support and parts 
for the indefinite future, which yeah. there's that's if indefinite. They they made that very clear at uh, Spetsy, so that's right. But they are yeah. not going to continue to make them at Ghost Quest. That's right. Okay, the next one, Trey. There, that's one of your slides too, Peter. What do we got there? <laughs> that's a Bionics. We've sold those for over a decade. I'd and have to say that more more talk about Bionics than any other, de yeah. certainly defunct, or any other uh, e, e assist system that's no longer being made. Tell us about the Bionics a little bit and your yeah your background with it. Well, when they first started out, they were they were very interesting. They worked well when they worked, but we had some trouble with them, and we dropped them for a while. But they got it together, and uh, they were made a nice system, and we were going along real happy with them. And all of a sudden, out of the blue, the parent company went under with twenty million dollars in debt. And there's some talk about them coming back with uh, maybe from China or they're in Europe now or I don't know. But there are, currently there's no there's nothing going on. There are some people that will rebuild the batteries, apparently, but I'm yeah, not we, aware of that. We particular. rebuild them here, too. Oh, yeah. um, OK, great. Yeah. Yeah, I was actually before I even started this store, I was making a, a, a small, a small little side business of fixing bionics parts. Um, and in fact, I'm sorry to interrupt. I meant to say, I was going to say this at the end, but that's a great time to say it. No matter what you do, don't buy an electronic assist that requires proprietary parts. And Bionics mm -hmm. is the poster child for this. And, oh, yeah. you know, yeah, I mean, just don't. I mean, you know, you'll thank me over and over again if you, if you, if you, if you don't, because Bionics. I, I, you know, I don't know this. This is here. This is this is my feeling on it. Spent half of their R and D on developing proprietary technologies to make you use their stuff, and that had to be what caused some of their issues. Because lithium ion batteries die over time, and they're expensive to replace, and you'd have customers. And I know Peter has had the same thing happen. Customers come in and they go, "Wait a minute, you want six hundred dollars for a replacement battery? I can go on Amazon and buy an, a Magic Pi for four fifty with the battery." Why am I spending six hundred dollars for this? And it's it's very aggravating to explain to that. And then now that they're out of business, you've got to have guys that are specially especially electronics guys to get in there and, and uh, delouse the electronics in them so that you can put normal batteries. Yep. Okay. Sorry about yeah, that, Peter. Good, Go ahead. Good, Sorry about that. I, I totally agree with that. The it's a very dedicated system, and you can't just plug another battery into it. It has a computer in the battery, and a computer in the hub, and the computer in the handlebar, and they all got to speak English. You know. So uh, that's a problem. Okay. Yeah, yeah, don't buy a system like that. Yeah, no, I agree. <laughs> or like this, for that matter, right? Uh, yeah, or like this. Speaking of things not to buy. <laughs> I'm not familiar with the Continental. Yeah, Doug, uh, Doug go, go ahead, Doug. About the Continental. It's just so, another one that's... Yeah, I mean, this is, I mean, you can go you online and find, yeah. out, find the war stories on these things. They were a great idea that didn't work. Uh, over-engineered, abundantly... What, what was the term my professor used to say? Oh, abundantly over-engineered. Right, and uh, so it uh, it has to make it successful in the marketplace, doesn't exactly. it? Exactly, you know, and, and I wish it had had because it did have some nifty features. But my, you know, talk about you know, it was just over engineered and overpriced. Uh, All right, and, enough of the failures. Let's go on. <laughs> we we Let's go on to more successful. At, at, what's that? We, we haven't talked about ride kick. No, no, we're going to go to your oh, slide right now, actually. So oh, okay. we're going to talk about, the, oh, yeah, that's right. Um, yeah, we forgot, right? Go, go ahead to the next slide then. That's right. I'm sorry, Peter. You're right. Uh, let's, wow, that's linear. Another that's bionics. Bionic. And obviously the, the bike was put on. There we go. Right there we go. Yeah, yeah there's a the ride kick. Tell us about this, Peter. Okay, that's an electric assist trailer. It's kind of a neat deal because you hook it on your bike and you run a wire up to the handlebar to control it. And then if you want to ride the bike naked, I mean, without the motor, Hello. You, you just unplug it and take the trailer off and there's the battery and the motor and everything is gone. It takes like 20 seconds to put it on and off after the first install. So it's very simple and it's neat that way. One of the downsides is that there's, not, there's only one drive wheel and there's not much weight in the drive wheel. So if you're climbing a hill in a dirt road, you'll spin that tire. Uh, on pavement, that's not a problem. It's a neat little unit. They're currently for sale, I believe, if anybody wants to yeah. buy an electric company. Yeah, they, I love these things because of what Peter just said. I mean, I, I hope I hope somebody will buy them. I hope somebody will take good care of that company because uh, the the they were just a neat. I mean, it was it was it was ten seconds here to hook it. Once the hitch was mounted, you hooked it on and off you went for for commuters for for pay, for path riders and what have you. They were fantastic. Um, you know, they they they. You, you just you 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 had non proprietary technologies in them. Yeah. Uh, you know, they they really did a good job for what they were. And if somebody was, 
I need, uh, you know, you had, you had a use case, and I'm very familiar with seen before, where I want something to help me with my, with my commute, but then I want to work out on the way home. And this was a great way to do it because they could, you know, they, they could turn it off or they could just use it when they do it. And it had, you know, and, it, and, and when they wanted just their bike or just their trike, they just unhook it and left it hanging in the garage and off they went. Yep. All right, guys, let's uh, let's move on to the, the new uh, bikes and trikes that you can buy with e-assist. And as we go to that, the, it, just hold on right there, if you would. Uh, guys, are just uh, out there watching. Please continue with the comments and questions. As you've noticed, if you are making a comment, I'll try to bring that up. We won't interrupt the guys, but it, we'll put it up on the screen so you guys can all see it. And if you have a question, we'll make sure that, uh, that our uh, panelists or guests uh, answer that for you. So... Uh, back to the uh, to the chat. If you guys uh, would like to um, uh, take a look at that and, and and contribute to it, that'd be great. All right. Uh, so Bosch. Now uh, these guys are making some noise right now. Uh, Doug, you want to start with that? Uh, tell us what's. Uh, yeah. What's I, so so you're starting starting to see Bosch as an OEM product on a lot of the trikes. Ice is now selling a, a Bosch unit. We put one of those in the field just the other day. Uh, I like them a little bit better than the Shimano option, although the Shimano is going to change theirs now. So this may flip back and forth. But for these OEM bikes, uh, it's 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 hard to beat the integration. It's hard to beat the simplicity of use. The batteries can be popped out and changed out. So that's that's a big plus. Uh, certainly a big plus over Shimano, which currently has a little bit of proprietariness to their packs. Uh, the, uh, the Bosch has also done a good job with the dealer support. Um, so when we're dealing with them, they've been really helpful. So when they get everything in this world gets a little finicky at times, uh, pick up the phone and call them and being able to say, Hey, look, I got a bike here. Here's what I'm doing. And they can give me an answer real fast. And I, I don't have to spend a couple of days going back and forth with them on their call center and email, which is unfortunate with some of the other companies we deal with. What, uh, uh, what is the Bosch before, before we leave uh, Bosch, what is Bosch coming on these days? TerraTrike? Is that right? Uh, yeah. I believe it's on TerraTrike and it's on ice. Cause we've been putting ice in the field with them. With those well, I don't too. think ice, I don't think ice is, uh, is coming out with Bosch. I'm sure you could maybe do something with it. Peter, do you know? Uh, Bosch comes on TerraTrike. I'm not aware of it being available on ice unless that's a new mid mid year. It's an, it's, an, it's an, it's a new thing. I mean, we literally okay. just had one come okay. in from them. Cool. Okay. Wow. Okay. Very good. Okay, let's go on uh, past Boston. And speaking of ice, this is what we do know. There's an ice. Right? Yep. There, yeah, there, go ahead, Peter. You can probably take that if you want. Peter, go, that's tell us That's the traditional about... one there. Yeah. Yeah, this is an ice with the Shimano steps, and they come in two different powers, the 8000 and the 6100. The 8000 was originally developed for mountain bikes to give maximum torque, and the 6100 is developed for road bikes to give maximum battery life. Uh, they're a neat unit. They work real well. Because they're a mid-drive, you get to use the rear gears of whatever sort of gears you have, derailleur or hub gear. And that means that the motor can spin at a higher speed while you're climbing a hill. So mid drives tend to be better climbers than like the Bionics was not a great climber. Bionics was good for flatland. Uh, you can also get integrated light kits from ice with it, which is a nice, nice touch. Peter and Doug, what are you seeing? Which of those two motors are you seeing most uh, being sold on your ice trikes, the 6100 or the 8000? The big one or the medium one? We're seeing more of the 6100, the small one, and the bigger battery. Yeah. So it gives, it gives you maximum exactly, range. You know. Yeah, that's exactly what we're seeing, too. I, I maybe okay. have, have one 8000. Everything else has been 6100s and the big battery. Okay. Now, yeah. we don't have a lot of pictures of controllers, so this is kind of important. So those of you that are not familiar with, uh, with eAssist, you're going to have a little computer-type uh, uh, display that you see there that's going to show you the different levels of assist. And uh, sometimes it, it can be three different levels. I don't know. Some of them go much more than at five or six different levels. And you can also, with the Shimano system, the step system, can also get electronic shifting along with that, which is a real package that uh <laughs> not not cheap but boy oh, it's no. pretty nice it is pretty nice yeah. and even uh, yeah. what even automatic shifting which i've tried and not a big fan of it uh, myself but uh it will shift automatically when i was shooting video actually it did work out nicely for that because i didn't have to reach my hand down to shift but uh this is a typical kind of display would you guys say, agree with that uh, for what you see yeah, I mean that's that's the that's a very common. I mean that's what most of them are walking out the door with when the ice strikes right now. Um, exactly that display, exactly that configuration on it. Uh, I don't know about Peter's shop, but it, that's what we sell. Yeah, that's what we sell. Now the yeah. the Bosch has got an option to have electronic shifting with a roll off hub. Right. 
and that's pretty cool. That's we're looking forward to having that available on the ice trikes. Yeah. And tell us what uh, tell us what advantages that would give you, Peter. Well, the roll-off hub is a bomb-proof, super durable internal hub that has 560% gear ratio, 14 gears. So it gives you a really wide gear range, really low maintenance, super durable. The electronic shifting means you push a button to shift up or down. When you come to a stop, it senses that. It automatically downshifts to an easy gear to restart from. It's just a nice integrated package. It is not cheap. The, the hub alone is $1,400 or so. Plus the so there's singing the gamer wanting to know a ballpark price for those. That's just that's very timely. There you go. They're, yeah, I would say a, an ice trike, nicely outfitted with that system, is going to be ten thousand dollars. You probably okay. could come in a little below that if you got you know no suspension and just the hub and the motor. But who's going to do that? We haven't seen anybody do that. They come in and they go woohoo. You know, as long as I've got suspension, I'm going to be going 20 miles an hour a lot. I will, or as long as I've got a motor, I'm going to be going 20 miles an hour. I'm going to want suspension. Yeah. So, yeah. And then I will, I'm all going to want heavier tires and I'm going to want, I'm going to go longer distances. I'm going to need more luggage space. I'm going to want, you know, and as long as, well. Guys, yeah. Here's, here's a question uh, from uh, Donald R. We, I don't think we really talked. We talked a little bit about drag, but how about, uh, well, back that up if you could. Well, it doesn't matter. We could show you the shot. Go ahead and put the Outrider on. Uh, Dave King is asking about the Outrider, and we're going to talk about that in a second. But we can answer because I think it has it as well. Um, regenerative uh, braking is is uh, something that people that have electric cars know a little something about. Do either of you want to talk about? Because uh, some of the some of the trikes have that on them too. Tell us about those. None of the mid drives, I don't believe. Yeah, no mid drive has it. It's only it's the hubs. Thing. Yeah. All the hub motors and not, I, I, not all of the hub motors, I guess. I, I know that the, we're going to see, I think the Outrider does, and I know Velox right. does when I talk to Lars at uh, Spetsy. You're going to see those in a minute. But so, yeah, if you want to slow yourself down when you're going downhill and put power, that's called regenerative braking. And there are a few. You'll have to check, uh, Donald, to know exactly which ones. But I'm, I'm well, sure that the Velox does, and I think the Outrider does as well. The, the, one of the, Fal the Falco kits can be built that way because that's how my yep. daughter's is built. Okay. And, uh, All right. And actually but, have a have a meter to show you on hers. It's because I'm an electrical engineer, as you sort of mentioned earlier. I, I let We've you got also, yeah. yeah, we sort of we get over gadgeted the thing. So it's got a meter that actually shows you how much energy gets put back in the system when she uses those brakes. And it's, it, you know, depending on the course, it can be a few percent, you know, a few percent, which doesn't sound like much, but that translates into, you know, 10 miles or so. Yep. Trey, you can know? you back up to the Outrider for a second? Uh, Dave did uh, ask about it. We did mention the Outrider as a mid-drive uh, at the beginning, but uh, this is a little bit wider picture of it. And yeah. Doug, you had a little something I know you wanted to say about the Outrider. Well, so okay, so Outriders are an interesting breed. Um, they have a pedal, a pedal, like pedal assist. We've seen that at RCC and a couple of other places, and they're nice. But they are almost an ATV with, uh, you know, incredible range, incredible energy into them. And they're, that's a market that's a little different than the commuter market and recumbent trike market. So I, I you know, I, uh, I haven't moved any of these. I've, I've had people come in the store and ask about them, but we start talking about pricing, and then we start talking about practical, practical practicality uh they tend to wander over toward the the direction of the other vendors in there because they're not looking for an atv they're looking for a trike with pedal assist and so this is uh going to be an in interesting market i wish them luck i mean they're 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 absolutely a blast to ride uh and uh, i just I, I wonder about their 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 the market niche they're aiming for and and, and certainly when we talk about some of the controversies here I, i'm, I'm going to use them as an example of something that's happened in our area Okay. Uh, one thing about the regenerative braking, yep. if you live in a flat area, it doesn't do much for you. But if that's you right. live in an area that's really hilly, around here, you know, when I talk to somebody on the phone, they're saying, well, I want to buy a recumbent. I used to say, how hilly is it? And they go, oh, it's pretty hilly. It's not very hilly. And what does that mean, right? So now I say, well, if you were to coast down a hill without brakes, how fast would you go? And they say, oh, a big hill, I'd coast 20 mile an hour. Well, that's a small hill. Around here, a big hill, <laughs> a, a big hill is 50 miles an hour around right. here. They're just on, a hill like, on a hill like that, first off, you recharge quite a bit of energy in the battery. And secondly, you don't uh, burn up your brake shoes. And yep. on a yep. Velomobile, I think that would be particularly important, as Doug, yep. I'm sure, will be happy yep. to chime in. Just a quick note here from Joe Antonio. The Copenhagen wheel, he says, does regenerate and brake by pedaling backwards. It does. So did, yes, that's correct. That's correct. Okay. 
All right, That's a, the Copenhagen is a neat unit. The limited range is the only thing against it, but it's a neat unit. Okay. Yeah, I agree. That's the, that's the that's the one thing that 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 puts. And we'll talk about range. In fact, we're about to talk about range. So we could go ahead. Yeah, and let's talk go about on to the Velox uh, real quickly again. Let's finish up with uh, yeah. that one with the huge battery and uh, basically mostly sold just in Europe right now. Uh, although Lars says he'd like to start. Uh, I know sending these to the U.S. <laughs> as well. So it uh, it's a very really, it does have regenerative braking. I I rode it while I was at Spetsy. Very interesting. Very interesting trike. So, all right, what's next here? Let's move along to the next. Uh, uh, to, to, to what Peter was oh, saying. Yeah. Go ahead. You know, we, we were, he was just right there about hills versus hills. Yeah. And uh, uh, I use a little bit different analogy that Peter does, but we say the same things, which is basically, you know, the, you know people talk about the endurance in these things. And, and everybody, and, and, they, and Peter probably says, when you talk to somebody, say, how far can I go on it? And the answer is, it depends. Uh, it, you know, it, it depends on you. It depends on how much energy you're going to put in it. It depends on the terrain. It depends on the time, you know, the, the time of the year, because cold has a different number than hot. Uh, all these things. So, um, you know, I, again, I use a ex personal example. My, my my daughter's 700. I have three um, huge 36 volt batteries on this bike, wired up so that she can get 120 miles of my kind of streets out of that thing in endurance. And that means the bike weighs over a hundred pounds in batteries. Uh, but she can get on it and she can pedal at, um, you know, a, a small assist level because her issues, uh, that she needs to overcome have to do with the weight with the bike going up hills. And so it's just designed to flatten out the hills. Um, but that was a, you know, a, a fairly built adaptive cycle for her. Uh, the standard Shimano step systems that, that, that we both sell, um, we're seeing people in our areas getting about 50 miles out of them before the batteries die. Um, and uh, that seems to be about the thing, but our area is mostly small hills as, as to use Peter's term of what a small hill is. It's a 20 mile an hour hill as opposed to 50 mile an hour hill. You get those in the mountains and that's going to curtail their endurance quite a bit. Um, okay. You know, so this, this all kind of feeds into this business about, how you choose what model is right for right. me if I'm looking for e-assist. And Doug, you kind of broke it down, uh, and you guys have both already talked a little bit about this into uh, the question of like, what kind of riding do you do that's going to help to make the decision? I guess it's no, in in essence, no different than how you would choose any uh, bike or trike, right? Except right. Uh, this is going to, this is going to be going in a little bit different direction. So, uh, Doug, you talked about power versus endurance. Flats sure. versus hills and and commuters uh, kind of thing. So let's let's break that down if we could, you guys. Sure. So uh, we started to talk about that. So the power the power versus endurance is how much how much do you need to get out of this thing? How hard do you want to push it? How much are you going to add in? And that's going to equal the endurance. And so when you're in rolling hills or in flat hills, uh, or in flat hills, guys, in flat roads, uh, your your um, you, you, the amount of energy you're drawing off the system. Uh, will play a role in how much endurance it's got. Uh, and I use the commuter analogy. Uh, a lot of commuters want to ri ride a bike to work, and they don't want to sweat. They don't want to arrive uh, sweaty. Uh, and so a couple of these things I've put together for people. I've said, Here, here's how to do that. We put a step system on you, set it to level nine, fully assisted, um, ride to work with that. And then when you're when you're coming home, set it to, to, to zero or level one and ride back. You'll be you'll have burnt 75 percent of your battery on the way to work, but you'll get you know, it, but you don't need it coming back because that's when you want your workout. So we, we do things like that um, and, 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 and other variable variations of that same theme to allow people to get the kind of riding out of the vehicle they want. Sure. Uh, and, 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 and. You know, the, the, the biggest issue and we, we you know, we really have haven't talked to this, and this is the place to bring it in is what happens when the battery dies. Right. Because so I think this is endurance versus longer endurance, right? That right, you were talking right. about. So go, tell us about what, what you're thinking. So, in there. so, so there's a couple of solutions here. Some people, uh, like with the Velomobiles, Peter mentioned, uh, because you've got such a big shell, I, I, I always encourage the Velomobile guys that buy an e assist. I said, buy, buy the small battery and the big battery and use the small battery to get home. So if you run the big battery out, pop it out of the cartridge and put the little battery in it and, and, and know you've got 20 miles and that's about it. Uh, All right. 
could be that Doug was just struck by lightning. We don't know what happened exactly. So let's, <laughs> Peter, I'm glad you're with us here. So I'm up. <laughs> you, you are, you're up. Actually, I think that's going to pretty much cover it for that. This is okay. the point actually where I wanted to start talking about uh, about touring with eAssist. This is something brand new. Good. We have a, a very special guest that has quite a bit of experience in all this. Uh, Lars, can, can we I, bring can I this? Something just in the yeah, interview? please do. I'll give you a segue here. We had a couple come in and he rides a diamond frame bike and has ridden a lot, a serious rider for years. And she, he never really could get her to ride. She wanted to ride, but it wasn't comfortable and she couldn't keep up. You know, this is, we've all heard this story before, right? So she got a trike and they got a pair of batteries and he would carry one battery in his pannier and she'd pop a battery on the trike. They went from Philadelphia to Washington, DC. And at lunchtime, they would just switch batteries. And then at night, somebody had to get up at one in the morning and switch batteries in the charger in the motel. And they had a great time. It allowed, she could keep up. She had all day range. It worked great. There's your segue. Perfect segue to introduce a good friend of the show. It's Sylvia. Sylvia, are you? can we hear you now? I hope so. Yeah, good. Yes, we can. That's you can great. hear me? We can hear you. Thank you. Oh, so great. Fantastic. Sylvia is out in Portland. She's back from being on tour. She's, uh, as most of you know, Travels by Trikes is the name of uh, her enterprise. And uh, she does travel by trike all over the world. And uh, Sylvia, we're going to we're going to look specifically, though, today, uh, uh, talk specifically today about uh, e-assist, though, with traveling. So you sure. have done this in the past. You don't do it right now, as I understand. And I, you're thinking about it again. So let's let's start. Sure. Uh, if we could tell us about uh, your experience in the past traveling uh, with e-assist. What was that? Yeah, so I did a 6000 mile tour around the United States with electric assist. This was a long time ago. It was in 2010, and I think it was my fourth tour. So I had done a tour from Canada. I spent, you know, down the Pacific coast. I spent six months in Mexico, and I ended in Guatemala. And then the next tour, I went to New Zealand and Australia. It was my longest tour. I think it was 10 months. And then I went to Southeast Asia. I rode through... Uh, Vietnam, Laos, Cambodia, Thailand. And this whole time, I was very overweight. I weighed probably 90 pounds more than I do now. And I wasn't losing any weight. And by the time I got to Thailand, almost towards the end of my tour, you know, I wasn't losing any weight. It was so unbelievably hot. And the hills were incredibly steep. And I started dreaming about using electric assist and the idea just really got a hold of me. And so at the end of that tour, I came back to the US, back to Portland, like I do every summer, and started talking and looking around and researching, you know, what it would take to tour with electric assist. And you know, before every tour I do, I always go online and look at blogs because I'm telling you, if you're thinking about doing a tour, it doesn't matter where you're thinking about it. Somebody has already done it and they've written about it and it's on, you know, there's a blog that you can read. Well, I, I couldn't find any blogs of anyone that had gone, had used electric assist. I found, actually I found two, but they were um, sacked. And so they went across the United States, um, but they had extra batteries in the van. And I was like, well, I, I don't want to do that. I want to be unassisted. And so I was looking around and there's a company, there was a company here in town. I, I'm not sure if they're still in business or not. It was called EcoSpeed. And at the time they were like, just to tell you, Sylvia, I see Peter shaking his head. No. So I guess uh -oh. he knows they're gone. They were great, great product. Yeah, they're gone. They're gone. It's too they're bad. Gone. They're really nice people. They, they run a bike shop now, and they do they do a good job. But yeah, Brad Davis, I think, Brad took Davis. over. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Really, really, a, just a nice, nice guy. Yeah, he is. And they were kind of like the Mercedes of electric yep. assist. Like yep. it was the best of the best. And I was like, well, yep. you know, they're right here in Portland, it just made sense. And then yeah, Pat, go ahead, at, Pat at Paracycle. Um, 
designed an extra cycle. You know, you've seen those long tail bikes that have like the extra cargo, you know, part at the back. And he designed one for trikes. And I was like one of the first people to put one on my trike. And it was, it was amazing. It was absolutely amazing. It looked so cool. I, you know, the motor, it was a mid, mid drive motor went behind the seat and then the controller and all the wires were under the extra cycle. And so it was just so clean. And, you know, this was at a time when electric assist, like the systems were messy and there were wires all over the place. When was this Sylvia? 2010. Okay. Yeah. 2010. And, um, you know, even though I really didn't know what I was doing, I didn't know if it would work. I just thought, you know what, I'm going to, I'm going to try. It was really just a big experiment. And another little side note about this is just before this tour, I started doing Weight Watchers. So while I was doing this tour, I went down the Pacific coast to Los Angeles. And then from Los Angeles, I took the Southern tier across to Mississippi and I took the, the Natchez Trace to Tennessee. Nice. I went up to Kentucky to visit my sister. And then I started coming back on the Trans Am and it turned out to be 6,000 miles. And the whole way I was stopping at Weight Watchers meetings. At, like I would come to a town and I'd be like, is there a Weight Watchers meeting? And I would go and get weighed in and talk to everybody. And of course I was losing weight the whole way. and there were a number of issues that I had. It was, it was, it was cool on one hand and then it wasn't so great on another. I tell mean, us you about have it. To, yeah, yeah. Let's tell us about it. I mean, the, this, the is you know, this is like, you know, an old, like the pioneering of electric assist. Right. So I'm sure, you know, the problems that I had are probably not existent anymore. Um, the, the motor was flawless. It worked great. Um, I had trouble with, this, I had a throttle, a thumb throttle, and you know, at the time they were just ch cheap Chinese parts, and I went through two. Uh, the two of them failed, and then I had the controller was uh, oh, it was Grin Technologies out of Canada, Justin. Oh, I don't remember his name. He's such a neat guy, and he just does incredible work. And he had to ship me a new one, uh, but the motor worked flawlessly. Um, there was a problem with, I had two batteries, uh, 10 amp hour batteries, and I used um, a fast charger for each one, um, which was pretty cool because I could charge both batteries at the same time and they could go from empty to full in an hour and a half. And what so, kind of range did you get? Yeah, it wasn't great. Um, you know, of course, it just like this is a very controversial topic because it just depends on how you use it. Right. And the Pacific coast route in particular is very, very hilly. There's a hundred thousand feet of climbing. If you go from, you know, Washington all the way down to Mexico and some of the hills have really steep gradients, um, you know, like, especially like where the the hairpins are, they always seem to add a few extra percent at the, at the hairpins. Um, but I would typically, you know, get maybe 20 miles from a battery, um, maybe less depending on the hills. But I felt like, you know, finding electricity is super easy. Electricity is everywhere. Even at campgrounds, I would stop at um, Hiker Biker. Yeah. And, it, you know, you can just ask any RV to, you know, drop off my batteries and charge up. And I never had anybody say no you could have so, you could have charged up at Weight Watchers really if you thought about it and I and I probably did <laughs> yeah, <laughs> I probably, that worked out conveniently. probably did yeah <laughs> I that's never great. had any trouble finding electricity it was that was not yeah. a problem but like you know if I wanted to stop for lunch you know to stop for an hour and a half and charge up my batteries that's not that's not such a big deal I did have an issue once I used um I used an RV and they had some weird voltage thing, which I didn't, you know, I didn't know anything about, but they blew out the battery okay. and I had to send it back to EcoSpeed. Um, it was the first time they'd ever worked on a battery and it was the last time they ever worked on a battery. I had to ship it to them. 
they had to completely take it apart, which apparently is super complicated, or at least that battery was. And they said never again. And but they did, they fixed it and they they sent it to me. But I always had battery. I always had at least one battery. So so you never fine. found yourself having to pedal completely without battery at any point. Is that right? I yeah. never did. Okay. I never did. Because that's and a fear, of course, with the long, well, the long distance touring, of course, and batteries. So something yeah. you probably don't want to do. All right. So you did this, you learned about it, but then you didn't use it again after that trip, right? I didn't. And, you know, I just found that, you know, I have a feeling that that particular system, it wasn't really integrated into my trike well. And so I never had like a good rhythm when I was climbing to get the right gear. And I was with a thumb thrifter, thumb shifter. It was really hard to control how much power I was using. And I was always using more power than I wanted to use. And um, it was really hard to say like that it was really worth it. I, sure, I'm a super slow cyclist. But maybe I got to camp an hour, hour and a half earlier than I would have without it. And I just felt like I was carrying so much extra weight. And, you know, there was just all this like fiddly stuff to deal with every day. And I just right. kind of, and I didn't really, really need it. It's not like, you know, I travel alone. It really doesn't matter how slow I am. So uh, to the, be fair, this is technology that you were using that that it, that was what 10, 15 years old, right? Uh, Ten years oh, more. old. More, anyway. it's nine. Yeah, yeah, yeah nine yeah. years so, old. Yeah, so so things have changed. I guess so. I, I want to kind of get to where we are. So you did. You've done quite a bit of of uh, touring be, between then and now, and uh, right. none, none of that then with e assist. But I know exactly. we've talked a bit. Uh, over the last few months, and I know you're thinking maybe changing, and at least you're giving this some serious thought again. Tell us yeah. where you are now with your thinking yeah. on, on the assist. Well, tour. to just finish up, you know, mm -hmm. the crazy thing about that tour was I was doing Weight Watchers and I lost 90 pounds. And I was riding a Green Speed GTO and it became too big for me. I had already cut the boom, I couldn't bring the pedals any further in. And so I had to buy a new trike. And so I bought my HP Scorpion FS20 and, um, you know, just went without assist. And so I've been unassisted ever since then. Okay. And, you know, I keep, you know, I keep thinking about it, especially the last tour I was in Colombia, you know, you know, I'm, I'm riding at like nine, 10, 11,000 feet in elevation. My next tour, I'm talking about Ecuador and the the mountains, they go up to 14, you know, 18,000 feet. Like this is a lot of climbing and electric assist sure would be nice. But I, you know, there's one big issue with um, electric assist for touring. If you want to go out of the country and you need to take an airplane and you can't get the batteries on a plane, you just, it's just not possible. And so I just can't figure out how to make it work. Um, while I'm doing these tours out of the country. And the big reason I do these tours out of the country is because I always tour in the winter and it's just not possible for me to tour in the United States in the winter. I've already done the Southern Tier twice. And let me tell you, it is the warmest place in the U.S., but it is so cold. And so I'm looking for warmer places to to go so yeah that's so right of, now the biggest conundrum for you then is uh is is the battery issue you'd have to find a way to ship them or some other way of getting there and it doesn't seem practical right or or easy enough for you right now then i guess yeah it's it's a little bit you know it feels a little bit complicated um you know i have kind of an interesting living situation here where it's it's not my house and i house it for a friend who lives in france for six months over the summer and then when she comes back to Portland, that's when I go touring. And I'm sure at some point this is, you know, this is going to come to an end. And that's probably when I will uh, really seriously consider putting electric assist on the bike because then I'll have uh, more freedom about how much time, you know, where I go and uh, mm -hmm. whether or not to take get on an airplane. Yeah. Okay. So we need to stay tuned. Uh, yeah. So Tark McCoy says... Can you mail the batteries ahead of you? So that's a possibility, but it's still well. It's kind of not because you know. Uh -huh. First of all, you know, mailing stuff to Colombia and Ecuador 
or Mexico, you just don't know if it's going to get there. And it, you're talking snail mail. You're not talking, it can't go by air. So it's going to take weeks. And what are you going to do for batteries in the meantime? I don't right. know. Right. Yeah. yeah, that's that's a problem. All right, Sylvia, great. Uh, thank you for uh, sharing your uh, your experience with us on that. We're going to move along. You stay with us, though, because you can chime in on this. You may have some experience here as well. Uh, guys, we're going to talk now about the legal restrictions uh, and regulations uh, involved with um, with e-assist. Uh, and in, in doing so, uh, we have to kind of split it up, I think, in terms of talking about trails talking about uh, and talking about roads uh, because many of you uh, trike riders out there ride trails almost exclusively, but many of you ride on the roads and many of you do both. So uh, separate issues. Uh, there are places where I know uh, they say no motorized vehicles and it may involve what you are riding with in terms of your e-assist. It may not. And on the roads, you know, what is considered a motorized vehicle? So uh, we're not the only ones to be thinking about this thing. Doug has pointed me to this uh, website. You see the slide here called uh, People for Bikes. And the thing I take away from this is all the multicolors. It really means it's a hodgepodge. In the U.S., uh, there are so many uh, uh, regulations and rules and laws in various different places that if you wanted, if you were Sylvia Halpern and you wanted to do a U.S. tour with motorized a trike at this point, you'd be hard pressed to know if it was okay for you to do so on a particular trail or on a particular road in a particular state as you travel. So um, yeah, let's jump back to Sylvia for a second. I guess, uh, you know, maybe 10, nine, 10 years ago, this wasn't an issue, but maybe it would be now if you decided to. Who are... Yeah, Sylvia, go ahead. Would, well, uh, do you know, you personally, I just, I just don't know how any, has anybody ever gotten a ticket? I mean, I don't see how these oh, yeah. laws are enforced. I, I really don't. Um, not a speeding ticket, Doug. We're not talking about speeding tickets. No, 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 no. Just no, like no, using, no. Okay. using electric assist on the trails or on the roads. I mean, some places it's 250 watts, but like, how is anybody going to know how many watts your motor is? Or Yeah, so I mean, that I think that, that kind of attitude is what a lot of people take. But Doug does have some direct experience. Go ahead, Doug. Tell us about you know. Well, I mean, so this is where we have the outrider trike story. So, because uh, I actually did some more research since you and I talked about this, because I really wanted to know what brand trike. I mean, talk, that's when you're really a bike nerd because you want to go find the, what's going on. So we had, we had a city here. So not only does this map, let's just step back a second. Not only does this map show you the controversies in the ecosystem of the United States, but cities and municipalities have also enacted all sorts of regulations around this. So there is this is much more complicated in the U.S. than this map even depicts. A lot. A lot of the trails now are saying no motorized vehicles and e anything is considered motorized or they have started to enjoin them as, as if they're motorized the particular instance that happened here there was no signs like that on any of our trails somebody on a by on a trike happened to be an outrider trike was going really fast down one of the trails and ran through a bunch of people walking and broke some legs and arms and some other stuff with this thing because they flew through these this thing well you know, within nanoseconds, we had a municipal ban of any electric vehicles at all on these trails, which is so broad, it even kills scooters and things like that that are ADA type devices. But that's what's what's happening out there. So uh, the, the answer to Sylvia's question is what I always tell people is, look, just don't be a jerk. And you're probably not going to have any problems here, out here because no police officer is going to want to roll your trike over and look at the sticker on the motor to see if it's 250 watt or a 350 watt motor if you're riding like a bike. And, you know, Texas is one where we have a bazillion municipal laws around these things now. Uh, and I tell everybody the same thing. It's like, look, the state law says 750 watts. There's no speed limit. That's it. However, if you put 750 watts on a velomobile, you're going to do 45 miles an hour and it's going to create issues for you. And uh, somebody's going to get mad, and you're going to cause a issue for the community at large. So don't. It's just not practical. It doesn't make sense either. Act like a bike. You are a bike. Ride like a bike. Choose the same speeds. And everything else is a bike. And everybody will be okay. Yeah, so like Sylvia says, try not to just fly under the radar. If you just kind of go, the chances are pretty good. No one's going to notice or anything yeah. unless you draw attention. Mm -hmm. Like, yeah. Peter, how well, about well, you? Have you... Else? I think you know, there's, I'm sorry, um, no, you know, a lot of people when they, you know, trikes are often considered mobility devices and 
you know, I think that that probably plays a big part in it too, is if you're riding a trike, then um, people just assume you have a disability. And I think that kind of changes the, the, you know, the whole thing too. Yeah. Peter, have you, have you run into any issues uh, there in New York, for instance, or any of your customers uh, having problems with motorized vehicles, regulation or law wise? We had one customer with an electrified trike and he went on a limited access highway, which is probably not a good idea. <laughs> and he got pulled over and they let him off, but you know, you shouldn't do that. We also had a customer that bought a bike from us and then he added his own motor, gasoline motor. Mm -hmm. okay. oh, gasoline is noisy, right? Everybody can hear it coming. And uh, it's totally illegal in New York State. It's a moped. You have to have directional signals and a helmet and a license and an inspection and whatever, all that, you know, all that legal stuff. So, and he didn't have any of that. Uh, and he got pulled over one day. Actually, we had another, he didn't get pulled over, but he, his rule was whenever I see a police car, I turn the pedals. And that way they won't know that I have a motor <laughs> if they're deaf, you know. Yeah. But well, we had another local guy that had one on a bike. He bought one of those, uh, you know, Taiwanese ones or Chinese ones from eBay. And he set it up on a cheap mountain bike and he was riding around town on it and the police stopped him. And he thought, oh, I'm going to be in trouble now. And the police pulled him over and got out of the car and walked over and said, where can we get some of these for our patrol bikes? <laughs> they didn't care at all, you know. So I, I don't see the police giving anybody any trouble. I agree with so Yeah. Yeah. I, I think it's more... If Act like a bike. Don't be a jerk. You're not going to have trouble. If you hit somebody at 40 miles an hour, you're going to get sued because right. that now you're acting like a car. Right. And, yeah. and a bike shop, uh, our insurance only covers us for electric assist up to 20 miles an hour. So if we set up something to go over 20 or that has gas on it, we have no insurance. So then you go out and hurt somebody and they sue us. So we won't do that. Okay. Yeah, we 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 have the exact same thing. We won't. Do, I won't let one roll out of the door uh, above twenty with a without the twenty mile an hour limiter on it. Even though right. Texas doesn't have that law, just because. Uh, uh, and this is what I always when I I've, I've been in front of a couple of city councils and some other things talking about this. A good fit bicyclist can manage twenty miles an hour. Uh, that this that's the number. And I mean, some of them are a little higher. Some of them are, are a little bit. But that's that's a number. That's a bicycle. When you're getting above that, you're stopping to be a bicycle and starting to be something else. And that's where you get legislative action in not such a good way. And we don't want that. We, we want this to be a pleasant. We want this to be uh, something everybody has access to. And, and anything that gets people out riding, whether it's e-assisted or not, is a good thing. When you start to create conditions that are going to cause that ecosystem to be narrowed, because of the legal situations that exist out there, that's not good for anybody, yourself or the community. Absolutely, Doug. Thank you. And so, yeah, we're sure that none of our viewers would be any of those uh, people uh, uh, pushing yeah. the envelope. <laughs> but if you see them, <laughs> but if you see them, make sure that you uh, let them know they're not doing anybody any good. So, all right, I think it's time we got to move along here. I've got a couple of questions that I got uh, before the show started. Uh, you guys stay with me because um, uh, you can just take these as they go. Um, from Alan uh, Michelet uh, via email, uh, he wants the opinion of friction drives and do they wear out tires? Yes. Huh. Good question and <laughs> quick answer. Because <laughs> what doesn't wear out tires? Right? They Can wear out the roller too. Here, here's yeah, a little bit. Exactly. Here's a good one though. Here's a good one. Can just one rear wheel of a Delta be powered, or is both better? Both is better, and it but costs one works. Hundred bucks more. <laughs> right. Yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah, one works, it's, but when you get into sand yeah. and and and, and yeah. rain and other things, you get some yeah. interesting torque. But, but uh, it's gonna it's gonna cost you to do it though. Yeah. All right, and Doug, uh, we, we kind of covered this. Can we do this real quickly here? So, if you are interested in adding e assist yourself, and many of the folks out there are, what would you recommend that? Where would you recommend that they go? And where would you recommend uh, that they learn about doing this? Uh, well, there are like a, a bunch of how-tos out there on the internet. There's some YouTube things on it. Uh, a basic electronics course, either online or, or, or in the community college area, or something like that, is, is absolutely worthwhile. Just so you know, you know, some safety stuff that, that you're not going to, I mean, for whatever reason, the YouTube guys I see all the time, they never talk about the fact that there's a bucket of sand and a fire extinguisher sitting next to their builds. Um, because you can short these things out accidentally and they do catch fire. Uh, and so it's, you know, you, there's just those kind of little bitty things that, that will make a big difference in that. Uh, but again, they're not complicated electronics devices, so you, you don't have to go to have a 
go to college to learn about them, but you do have to learn some basic, you know, don't make the red wire and the black wire touch each other for very long or the smoke comes out. <laughs> very good. And smoke is a bad thing. Well, okay, we have time they, for one story. Please go ahead, Sylvia. Okay. So I did an electric bike ride to the coast and back. It was for the recumbent retreat. And I was on my way back going along highway 30 on the Columbia river with my friend Don. And we stopped for lunch at a veterans park. And I thought, well, you know what? I don't really need to charge up, but there's a bathroom here. I'll just bring my batteries in and charge them up while we're having our lunch. So fine. So we go, we make our lunch and I go back to the bathroom with all my, you know, dirty utensils to like wash up afterwards. And I can't get into the bathroom because it's blocked and there's a police car and <laughs> this guy comes out and he's like, no, 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 no. It's totally closed. You can't go in there. And I'm like, really? It's like a bathroom at a, at a park. Like, why is it blocked off? And he goes, oh no, it's like, this is really serious. And I'm like, you know, I've got my batteries in there. Can I go in and get my batteries? And the guy's face was just like, it went from like, you know, fear to like shock to like his mouth just went wide open. Oh, batteries. So I poke my head in and there's a policeman. He's on his <laughs> knees. He's like, he's got the batteries, you know, and there's all these twinkling lights, you know, as they're charging up. And he's got a pair, he's got a knife out and he's like getting ready to cut one of the wires. Right. I mean, we've seen this on the movies a lot. Like which, right? which wire do you cut? And he's, you can just see the fear. He's so, so scared. And he really thought they were bombs. Oh and the God. bomb squad had been called. They were on their way. And I was like, no, 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 no. These are batteries for my electric assist. It's for my bicycle. And he got up and he was so angry. And he just said, I need to see your ID. I need to see it now. And I'm like, okay, but I've got like all these dirty utensils in this place. <laughs> and I like wash them first. And he's like, no, we need to like figure this out. And so I just said, well, come over, see my trike, and I'll show you how I'm using it. And anyway, it turned out all fine and good. Yeah, and he we didn't take a ride on your trike. End, but, oh, what a story. He, he, didn't, he didn't take a ride on your trike, did he? No, I won't. <laughs> but no, it, it's not okay. But it's yeah, he was, they were so That's great. Yeah. All right. Yeah. The word of the wise. Uh, yeah, folks, don't do that. Uh, put a sign up, I guess. This is for my <laughs> tricycle or something. <laughs> All right, uh, quickly, one more uh, comment kind of question I got uh, via Facebook from um, B.B. Cragon. Uh, please advise how to respond to very frequent official no motors allowed on trail signage. It's not a problem for me living in New York State since I can always explain to anyone who might challenge me that I have MS. I ride a terror trike traveler with an e-bike kit add-on. So, Sylvia, kind of to your point, uh, people do think uh, maybe if you're riding a trike that you may have some uh, physical challenges or whatever. And, of course, plenty of people do have physical yeah. challenges who ride on trikes. Uh, so, And we talked about the uh, no motors allowed. There are issues, of course, around the country. We've, we've kind of touched on that already, uh, uh, BB. So, uh, But thanks for the question there. All right. I think that is going to kind of wind up our segment on e-assist. We don't want to let this get out of hand. Yeah, go ahead, guys. What final comments? Go ahead. Yeah. One comment on the uh, rollers on the tire. Okay, they work, but they will wear out tires and they wear out rollers. But if it rains, they don't work. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> so your rim gets wet and it's or your tires wet and it's slippery, and so go home. Yeah, All go right. downhill home. <laughs> yeah, that makes sense. All right, anything, Sylvia? Any final words for you? You gave me a great final story. That was wonderful. <laughs> no, I think that's it. Oh, here. There, Larry agrees. Larry has not been able. I'm not sure why Larry hasn't come on. Larry, we, we miss you. you. If you can try to get on, we'll still try to pop you in here. But anyways, Larry, I'm glad you're on chat, and uh, we appreciate you watching. And, Doug, I think you probably summed it up pretty well already. We're going to go on with you here in a second. So, um, yeah, and Peter, uh, Sylvia, please. Uh, Peter, you need to hang on for sure because I'm going to come back to you on uh, on the linear, uh, a short uh, bit on the linear airliner in a little bit. So, But I think we'll put you backstage for right now. Sylvia, I'm going to put you backstage, but you're welcome to stick with us if you wouldn't mind. Thank you very much. Uh, both of you, uh, for everything uh, that you contributed today. Doug, uh, now we're going to take just a couple of minutes 
to talk about your trip uh, to the Shanghai Bike Show and your trip to China <laughs> uh, a couple of weeks ago. Uh, tell us about what you saw there uh, of interest to event riders and uh, and what you uh, think might be coming. Doug, go ahead. Well, so so first of all, uh, you know, I'm I'm a relatively newcomer to this industry. I mean, I've been riding bent since the '80s, but you know, being in the industry, and making and being part of it is 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 relatively new. So this is the first time I've ever gone to a, a bike show other than Interbike, which I snuck in a few years ago on somebody's pass. Um, and so the first thing that I would tell you is the size of this was just overwhelming. Um, people have asked how to explain that. I put some pictures up on Facebook. But but if you think about McCormick Center, uh, which we all know in the U.S. and how big it is, uh, this you could put McCormick Center in uh, – you could put two and a half of McCormick Centers in one of the halls, and there were eight of them here. Uh, and, and it was full of bike stuff. So uh, I, mean, the, uh, I used to, it was joking, my, my little Jeep, my little step indicator on my uh, iPhone told me that one of the halls, because I only got through one the first day, was 6.2 miles of walking uh, just through the aisles to talk to people. So it was just stupendously big. Uh, and there was everything from kids' bikes to 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 uh, to to adult racing bikes and everything in between. But uh, what wasn't what there was, a lot of? What wasn't there? And it's right where I was headed. Good segue there. Good straight man, Gary. What wasn't there was recumbents. Um, for the biggest industry show in the universe, there were three recumbents. One of them was a quad. There was one tricycle and one stick linear type style bent, and that was it. Um, and so I talked to the guy, people about it and said, you know, what do you think about recumbents? And the general census was the market was too small. Uh, the, 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 there's not enough of them out there today. There's not enough. They, and even the people that really understood the data knew that this was a huge growing segment. They're like, well, we're not sure how to, to uh, tackle it. And uh, those people we had extra meetings with. And uh, I've started talking to several of the manufacturers about what we might be able to do together to, to bring some more mass marketing to the recumbent industry. So things to come, Gary. That's the best way to say it. All right. Good, good. Uh, yeah, I know you saw interesting things and met with some people. So there's more to come on that. And we'll talk later on. Thanks for keeping that brief, Doug. We appreciate it. I hope All you right, out. folks. Uh, <laughs> at this point, I think it's time to go to uh, talk about the wonderful people that make uh, this webcast possible before we finish up. First of all, Let's get to the first slide. It is TerraCycle. From fairings to headrests, whatever accessory you need, Pat and crew have you covered. And Trailside.bike. If you find yourself in Florida near the Withlacoochee Trail, stop in and see Andrew and his crew. And Cruise Bike. Their patented race and record proven front wheel drive geometry changes the rules of cycling. Now, comfort doesn't come at the cost of performance, but fair warning, your cheeks may hurt from smiling. And Lightning Cycles, surprising speed, comfort, and agility featuring the superior climbing quality that you've been looking for. Check out Lightning Recumbents today. All right, guys. Now, we have a few announcements to make uh, in this segment, and I'm going to bring uh, Peter back. Uh, I was going to do this anyways, but Peter, you can probably do a better job. You have come out with an interesting um, new, uh, I guess, development of a product. It's the Linear Airliner. And we got a couple of slides to show that you had posted, I think. Tell us about this, Peter. Well, the Linear Airliner is a long wheelbase touring bike that fits in the two bags, the package is shown behind it there. It's a, a Linear Limo, our long wheelbase touring bike, and the only change is that we put a 20-inch rear wheel on it and we put a RANS folding seat on it. Uh, we're making up some custom uh, packing, reusable packing material for it, and it took takes about 15 minutes to put it in the box. It takes a 5 millimeter Allen wrench. Uh, with the Actually, with the with the Allen wrench pedals, you'll have to have a six or an eight millimeter also. So it's a really simple fold. It's not like a Brompton that goes into one little airline case, but it goes into two airline cases, and it's a real adult size uh, recumbent bike. Yeah, so, which is awesome. I mean, I saw a post on Bent Rider today, uh, Peter. I know you did too. A guy who had actually purchased one and and uh, flown with it. The wheels, the, the two big issues, of course, as you're well aware. 
the wheels are, are big usually, so you downsize the one wheel. And of course the seat, how in the world do you get a recumbent seat? Uh, and so you find one that folds and that is the, the perfect solution that Actually, you they, come up they with. They call it a folding seat, but it comes apart. Is that, okay, so you got the base and you have the back. The, wrench. The, the seat, it works great. Uh, it's a little less comfortable than the traditional RAND seat, which is notoriously comfortable. So it's, it's comfortable, but it's not quite as good as the gold standard RAND seat. And uh, the disassembling of the seat takes maybe a quarter to a third of the time of packing the bike. So, mm -hmm. you know, it's nice and it makes it work. Another thing about this bike is when you get home, you put a 26 inch wheel in the back and you got a limo. So it's, right. it's a back to wheel. standard then. And when, and you're, when you're touring, you might want lower gears anyway, if you're going to be carrying luggage. Right. That's, it seems like a great solution. There are not a lot of them for, uh, for, uh, re, re, for touring on a recumbent. So I, I uh, kudos to you for coming up with it, uh, Peter. Uh, and uh, I think what you stated was about, uh, four thousand dollars a little under four thousand dollars a little including. under we're still working on the packing materials but it will be a little under including the the the, the luggage it's as well including right? the luggage the packing materials the bike the whole deal yeah yep. so if you guys are interested uh get a hold of peter and i'm sure he can uh, set you up and uh and uh, find out more about the uh, linear airliner and i think you're uh, did I read also you're looking for a, another name for it maybe uh, so you might want to give them suggestions on yeah that, we, that. we've kind of settled on airliner but we're we're always looking for good ideas you know <laughs> super uh, who isn't all right thank you Peter all right uh, guys uh, at this point let me bring you up to date on the uh, on the videos uh, that the layback back report has posted since our last show uh, can we go to those slides uh, first of all um, you guys know that we'd been to Spetsy and uh, I finally was able to get the uh, video out, the special from Spetsy uh, 2019. So uh, that's one of the highlight videos of the year for us. Uh, I hope you guys will have a chance to uh, get on our YouTube channel and watch that. And then Lars has taken some of the extra video, the things that go on uh, along with all of the booths and the information about the bikes themselves and put together a really cool uh, short video called Spetsy unplugged. So I hope you'll uh, jump onto the uh, uh, the channel and, and take a look at that one. Really great job by Lars on that. And uh, our latest in um, our series of LBR at your LBS is from our trip to uh, Angle Tech. And uh, there's Kelvin Clark. Um, Kelvin does a, a super job uh, with his shop there. He's been in the business for a very long time. One of the more knowledgeable guys you're ever going to meet in the world of recumbent. So uh, I thought it turned out to be a really uh, fun, interesting video, uh, a few hijinks uh, thrown in. Uh, I think that'll make you chuckle. So uh, give that a watch if you would as well. Okay. Um, at this point, uh, something else has transpired since our last show. And uh, that is that we lost Ian Sims. Um, Ian Sims uh, is a uh, is Greenspeed actually the the tri company? He uh, was a man that was so widely known uh, in the recumbent industry as an innovator and uh, a generous uh, person, uh, always willing to answer questions whether it had to do with selling a product or not. I can tell you from personal experience, I haven't been doing this all that long, just a few years. But at the very early part, uh, when uh, Layback Bike Report was getting started, I reached out to Ian and uh, he was very generous in granting an interview and uh, willing to come on the show and work with me with a slideshow and told the story of his life uh, and, and the development of uh, bikes and trikes and motorcycles that he also worked on. Uh, just the most wonderful guy to work with. Um, he, um, he, was always willing to to jump out there and and promote the recumbent world. Always saw him at all the shows. Um, so I just want to really uh, extend my sympathies to the family and and say how much I'm going to miss Ian. And I want to open this up, uh, guys, um, to any of the others of you. I know you all have had experiences with Ian. Um, Doug, I know you wanted to say a few words. Can we bring Doug up and? Yeah, Doug, go ahead and tell me um, if you want to say, uh, give us maybe a short story of. Uh, uh, your I, it, it, I don't know that I could do that. Um, Ian uh, has been just a mainstream pillar of this uh, uh, industry. He's somebody I've reached out to with questions before. He's always been helpful. He's, you know, I, I, 
I, I, again, it's, it's, you know, it's, it's, he's going to be missed. Let me just end it with that. Okay. Uh, Sylvia, did you have a, something to say? Uh, let's bring Sylvia up. I thought maybe you might. Did you have something to say about Ian? Yeah, I could for sure. Please. I mean, my first, my first trike was a green speed GTO and Ian was just amazing. Like no matter where I was, he supported me and it was Ian who told me that I could take my trike and put it on a plane without boxing it, and no extra fees. I thought he was crazy, and it turned out that he was right, and I've been using his advice ever since um, with, with no, no issues at all. And he would completely support me no matter where I was in the world, and even with parts that weren't green speed parts, like for instance, I was in I was in New Zealand, and my Magura uh, hydraulic disc brakes completely failed, and I had um, my SRAM hub fail, and you know nobody knew anything about trikes, nobody knew anything about SRAM hubs, and he sent to a mechanic in Auckland uh, a total complete SRAM hub in, you know, ready to install and walked the mechanic through it on the phone. He charged me nothing and he sent it like overnight. He just sent it overnight. And I mean, this is the kind of stuff that Ian would do no matter what I needed, no matter where I was always just like right on it. And I mean, just amazing, amazing company, amazing man, for sure. I'm, I mean, I, I wouldn't have been able to tour the way I did without Green Speed. Thank you, Sylvia. And I, just to let everybody know, uh, I, I am sure that Ian didn't do that because it was Sylvia Halpern, because I can tell you many stories similar to what you just uh, mentioned, Sylvia, that Ian was there and ready to help people out under almost any circumstances without asking for anything in return. So, uh, Peter, did you want to say something about uh, Ian? You're uh, muted, I think, Peter. I mean, you actually want to hear me? Wow. Yeah, of course we do. That's nice. I appreciate that. Well, Ian came to Alfred one time and visited the shop, and it was just really neat to see him interact with customers. And he was always interested in what the customer wanted and how he could best, how, how could he improve his trikes to, you know, to get a little better bike out of it and to meet the needs of the American public more. And <clears throat> he was one of those guys like Gardner Martin that was just, he was so central to the company and he, his, you know, like Sylvia has said, I, I second everything Sylvia said about him taking care of people and being a good guy to do business with. Yeah, okay. we, I definitely miss him. He was also one of the fun guys to go see at the show every year. So I guess I'll still come to the shows, but yeah, he's going to be missed. Yeah. Yeah. A, a presence really different than any other that I experienced. So thank you, Peter. Thanks for that. So, okay. We're going to wrap up that part uh, with uh, again, uh, our sympathies to the family. Uh, Ian Sims, you'll be missed. Okay, uh, we have a couple of, uh, of uh, viewer submissions that we want to talk about uh, quickly. Uh, Stuart Moore, who was on the show uh, a few months ago with that wooden trike build from uh, Berlin, you might remember. Um, Stuart is also a, an amazing videographer and photographer. He's put together a, um, a documentary about the whole process called Saw, Sand, Glue. So it's not ready yet, but he does have a little uh, trailer and I'll put that link uh, in the uh, description below. You guys take a look at it. It's really cool. So uh, that's Stuart Moore. Thank you, uh, Stuart, for sharing that with us. And uh, let's bring uh, Larry up on stage if we can. Um, one of the other submissions that we got was uh, from uh, Jane Knight uh, in Texas. And I'm going to have uh, Larry uh, talk to you about what Jane said and uh, add a little bit to that. Uh, Larry, thanks. Go ahead. Hi. Thanks, Gary. Uh, this email was submitted by Jane Knight from Texas. Hello, my name is Jane, and I wanted to tip you all off about the Arkansas Senior Games that will be held in Little Rock, Arkansas on September 20th through the 22nd. Uh, I've been working diligently to try to get the National Senior Games to start including recumbents in their 2021 National Games. If I can do that, the state games will be included, including recumbent racing in the 2020 state games. It's an uphill pedal, but I'm working on it. 
Hang on just a second, Larry. Uh, Trey, okay. can we go to the uh, can we go to the slide on the? Uh, there we go, and then we'll have uh, we'll have one more. Go ahead. Thanks. Uh, Jay continues on. I approached Arkansas about including recumbents in their 2019 games. Not only did they gladly include recumbent bikes and trikes, they said yes to the inclusion of velomobiles. Uh, continuing on, unlike other senior games, Arkansas extends their age limit to include 40-year-olds not starting at age 50. And she concludes, why, why I am promoting these games, I am so slow they will need a calendar, not a stopwatch to time me. Yes, we are talking slow and self-defense. I am legally blind and hearing impaired and have about as much business riding fast as running with scissors, but what the heck. I am just riding the time trial, so the coast should be clear while I'm riding. Bottom line, I just want to have fun. So we'd like to thank Jane for sending that to us. And uh, continuing on for other senior games, in addition to Arkansas, there's a few other senior games coming up this summer. Nebraska, August 3rd and 4th, and Wyoming, August 8th and 9th. Both have a 5K and 10K time trials and 20K and 40K road races. Just to let you know, I registered for both of those a few days ago, and it was kind of cool that Nebraska's online registration gave me a choice of asking if I was on a standard bike or a recumbent bike. Lastly, uh, there's an additional incentive, a special offer from Mark at Bachetta. And let's go to that slide, please. There we Thank go. You. Thank you. Uh, Bachetta has added a page to their website to offer a 20% discount on any bike. Sorry, not any trike, but for races, racers in any of the national senior games. So that's it from here. Back to Gary. Thank you, Larry. Yeah, so I had a little chat with uh, Mark uh, Swanson there at Bachetta and really appreciate Bachetta getting behind uh, the national senior games with that incentive. Uh, they're really pushing for it. And uh, that uh, that message uh, they offer at the bottom, it kind of says something like um, if your particular state uh, has national has a, a senior games, but doesn't offer uh, openings to recumbents, talk to them, see if you can encourage them like Jane uh, did. And she continues to do around uh, the country. See if we can get uh, more and more of these states to recognize recumbents and uh, let you guys uh, uh, see if you can do some racing stretch those legs a little bit and compete. So uh, we hope that uh, we hope that does happen. So, uh, okay, so those are the um, those are the viewer submissions. And as a reminder, if you've got uh, pictures of your accomplishments or events that you want to share, uh, please do so. Send them uh, to us at laidbackbikereport at gmail.com. All right, what is coming up on the next Laid Back Bike Report? Well, I know a little something about what's coming up in the ne next Lay Back Back Report. It's uh, Jason Miller, first of all, will be with us. Uh, Jason has started a uh, YouTube channel, really interesting one. He rides his trike and uh, and kind of checks out various sorts of um, of products. What he took a nice look at was the Tannis tires. So uh, maybe you guys know something about that. These are um, rubber tires. Not uh, They have no uh, air in them. And uh, so they apparently uh, cannot get a flat, although uh, Jason may have something to say about that. So he's going to talk to us about his uh, his uh, YouTube channel and uh, Tannis Tires. And he also uh, will talk to us a little bit about, about something called the Velo Chair. We'll, uh, we'll look into that. We may have some other additional uh, items on that show that I'm working on uh, right now as well. So. Okay, uh, guys, uh, don't forget that uh, I've talked about it already. The description section of all of our videos have a clickable table of content. So when the show runs for like two hours, like this one did, I know that's a lot to sit down and watch if you're not watching live with us. So break it up into chunks. You can go and, and click on any of the sections and go to any part of the video that you like. And you got a whole month to uh, digest it. So a uh, clickable table of contents and then all of the links. Uh, to everything that we talked about today, I'm going to, when this show is over, go sit down, run through it, put those in there. So you'll be able to click on the links and uh, go directly to the websites that we talked about. You can find out more that way. 
Thanks again to uh, Brian. Brian Ball is not with us today. He is uh, off uh, uh, out of town and kind of busy, but we appreciate uh, Bet Rider uh, for all the promotional uh, activity that they uh, do for us. So thanks, uh, Brian. I think we'll probably see you next month. And thanks to my wonderful panelists who I introduced uh, at the beginning. You know what? Uh, I think um, Larry, I think finally made it. I, I want to at least say hi. Larry, there. Can we bring Larry on stage <laughs> before we leave? Larry, hello. <laughs> and you are muted or I can't hear you. So, uh, <laughs> but honestly, Larry's face is like 90% of the whole thing and you saw him wave. So Larry, we'll get you on next time. I hope so. If you're not doing a Santa thing, thank you, Larry Varney. All right. So yeah. Uh, and the rest of my panelists, you guys did a bang up job. Lars, thank you. We're working with this new stream yard system. It seems to be working great. Uh, and uh, you guys, I'm sure out there have noticed a little bit of change in what we're doing. I hope you like it. Let us, let us know if you like what you're seeing. Um, and uh, we would appreciate to uh, hear your comments uh, and suggestions on that. So, all uh, right. So yeah. Um, yeah, if you guys wouldn't mind, uh, again, uh, subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, go down there, click that little link where it says subscribe. Uh, su subscribe to our YouTube channel. Uh, like our Facebook page. Um, and check out our website, www.laidbackbikereport.com. You can uh, go right there or click on the little I uh, in the corner up there, and uh, it will take you directly uh, to our website where... You can see at the top all of our sponsors uh, right on the page there. Please support them. You'll see our most recent show, our upcoming shows, our past shows, our bonus material, uh, the pictures and other things that don't quite make it into the show. And you can sign up for our mailing list, uh, which uh, I send out an email uh, once or maybe twice a month that you guys know what's going on with that. So feel free to do that. And you can also... Buy a hat. There you go. There's Larry uh, modeling the hat. So um, I just got a new batch of them in. We were out, but I got them back in stock. 20 bucks plus $5 shipping and handling helps out the laid back bike report. We appreciate uh, what you can do for us there. So you can find it all at laidbackbikereport.com. So until our next webcast, folks, from all of us here at the Laid Back Bike Report, so long, Bent Riders.